Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast. What's been going on in the biopharmaceutical and pharmaceutical industries that isn't related to COVID-19? I'm Amber Lowry, Senior Editor of Special Projects for Pharmaceutical Technology, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are pleased to bring you this webcast presented by Pharmaceutical Technology and sponsored by KCAS. I would like to share a statement from our sponsor. KCAS is led by strong and recognized pharmaceutical, biopharmaceutical, and CRO experts for, excuse me, providing bioanalytical and biomarker development services. KCAS has proven success with over 40 years of stable, secure growth and focuses on providing expertise and service with the primary goal of remembering that our client's focus is developing products, not managing CROs. The main drivers of our client's success are communication, consistency, reliability, and our ability to find creative solutions. Learn more at www.acasbio.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the small square icon in the upper right-hand corner of the slide window, or by hovering your mouse over the lower right-hand corner and dragging the window to the desired size. The slides will advance automatically during the event. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the question mark help widget in the dock at the bottom of your presentation window. I would now like to introduce today's speakers. We are pleased to be joined today by John Perkins and Dominic Warno. John R. Perkins is the Senior Scientific Advisor with a focus on LCMS technologies at KCAS. Previously, he was at Q Squared Solutions and legacy companies for over 24 years, working in quantitative LCMS, principally in small molecules. His primary focus was on validation and sample analysis processes, as well as managing customer relationships in Ithaca, New York. More recently, he was responsible for the bioanalytical lab in Aust, the Netherlands. Dominic Warno, PhD is a senior scientific advisor. His role is to serve as scientific and technical advisor for both clients and internal teams for development, validation, and application of bioanalytical immunogenicity and biomarker methods for large molecule therapeutics. Dominic has worked on over 100 large molecule compounds, developing and validating PK, PD, AZA, and biomarker assays in support of PLEC excuse me, preclinical to phase four testing. Thank you for joining us today. John, please get us started. Hello everyone, and thank you for joining us for the KCS webinar and what we're doing outside of COVID-19. Um, just a quick agenda for the, for the presentation. There'll be this obviously an introduction, um, talking about maintaining business continuity at KCS. Um, as part of maintaining that continuity, how we're also looking to grow our services, and then the type of problems that we are confronted with and how we apply a team approach to resolving analytical challenges. So, although we were talking about, we really don't want to talk about COVID-19, we can't really avoid the, the, the effect it's had on our business and, and what, what we have to do to, to address the, the new conditions that we're working mm -hmm. under. Um, so basically, COVID-19 has dramatically transformed the business environment in the U.S. and the world. So, um, but because of the nature of a, the, the, the source of a pandemic, um, continued drug development is essential because the pharmaceutical industry is going to be the resource to, to basically solve the problem that the pandemic casts up. Um, for us, we are CRO, so our focus is maintaining business continuity such that the, all our external customers can rely on us to deliver um, to the project work that we've committed to so they can move their drugs forward and hopefully then address issues thrown up by the current environment. But for us, it's not just business as usual. Um, we have a long-term plan in terms of growth 
um, and investment in science and new technologies. So we're not just not just uh, paddling water here. We're really looking to grow and 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 build the company further. So a, a little bit of a, a back step, which everyone's very aware of, so I won't spend much time on it. But how did we get here? Um, December 2019 um, was the first cases from COVID-19 reported in China. Uh, Mid-January, first case on US soil. Um, and at the end of January, WHO declared a public health emergency of international concern. Um, but by mid-March, the WHO declared the outbreak a pandemic. Um, and in, in March, again in mid-March, the a US national emergency was declared over the coronavirus outbreak. Um, what we saw in late March was stay-at-home stay orders o issued amongst various states, which then really, for us, became, the major impact was the ability uh, on our ability to conduct business as usual. So, but for, for many of us who are industry veterans, it was we the, the biggest concern was how is this. Obviously, it constrains our life at home, but what effect is this going to have on our business? And the most recent experience we had of a, of a similar issue was in 2008, with the, where we went through the financial crash and the effect on the, the stock markets and then the effect on business there. So our, our concern was, is this a similar situation? Um, but the, there's, there's a fair amount of differences here. Um, in 2008, it was really, every, oh, oh, the recession was triggered by a financial crisis. And what we saw was a lack of money for investment, and it affected industries across the board. Um, for us as a CRO, um, our, suddenly our pipeline disappeared overnight because new contracts stopped halted, and so the actual CRO industry as a whole was was badly affected. In 2020, the trigger is the virus that we're all talking about, and hopefully we won't talk about much longer in this presentation. Um, but the the onus has been placed on the pharmaceutical industry because the the ability to address the virus is coming from this industry what we're also seeing is there that investment money is still available we're seeing ipos uh, for biotechs happening on a regular basis we're also seeing purchases of uh, amongst companies as as lot as companies try and grow their their base and 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 build their sort of their their scale and so um in, at least in this part, of the the in, at least in, in this part of the industry, we're seeing almost business as usual, with with some some issues that I'll, we'll touch on in later slides. So the trends that we've seen as a result of of COVID nineteen, particularly within the pharmaceutical companies that we deal with, um, we've seen closure of sites with limited or no access for scientists. Um, the first first part of the uh, development paradigm that was hit was that we saw the, the postponement and cancellation of some clinical trials. Um, but with facilities being shut or this meant that actually pharma companies, the, the need for CRO support became even more pronounced so that they could still move their business forward. With the, um, with the, uh, the emergence of the virus in China, one of the very early effects was that uh, non-human primates became difficult to source um, and the, the lead time for monkey studies particularly went, went up substantially. And so at this point I'd like to pass back to Amber for our first poll question. Great, thank you John. Now I'd like to ask our audience to participate in a brief polling question. Please click directly on the screen to enter your answers. Here's the question. How has your company reacted to COVID-19? No access to facility? Limited access to facility? Business access to essential employees only, non-essential employees working remotely? Business as usual with distancing controls in place? Again, how has your company reacted to COVID-19? No access to facility? Limited access to facility? Business access to essential employees only, so non-essential employees working remotely, or business as usual with distancing controls in place. Thank you for participating in our poll. So now let's take a moment to look into how the audience has responded. 
So it looks like most of the audience, almost 50%, says that business access to essential employees only is what's going on. So non-essential employees are working remotely, which is great news. But John and Dominic, is there anything you want to chime in with? Any sort of interesting finds you see? I see for KCS, we largely fall into bucket C as well, um, where it's our, our essential employees have access to the lab. Those of us who, who don't need to be there are, are remaining off-site. But it's still to see 40, almost over 40, uh, what is that, 37 or 38 percent that had limited to no access, that is quite a substantial number as well. Um, I found that to be, I don't know if that's surprising, but certainly that can have a major impact on uh, the pharma and biopharma industry. For sure. Thank you for sharing your insight on these. Um, John, I believe I'm going to pass it back to you for the rest of the presentation. Yep, that's correct. Thank you. So for KCS, um, our focus, as, as I mentioned earlier, because we're supporting pharma companies, is really on business as usual. Um, so, what, so like we mentioned, investment money is available, so drug development is continuing. However, with closure of facilities, um, the sponsors are having a, a limited ability to drive things internally. So this increases dependence on the CROs. So for us as a service provider, it's, it's vital that we show that day-to-day um, -day operation really hasn't changed uh, based on the current environment. So we 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 agreed upon timeline. We agree upon timelines at, at time of uh, contract closure, and we continue that commitment. Um, we have optimized the operation to accommodate current safety guidances, and like I met, previously mentioned, our non-essential employees are off-site. Um, we've also had a heavy focus on the supply chain. So we very early on, we, we ordered in excess of, of our need at the time, so we can rely on having resources in place for, as, our, as our projects progress. And, and then one of our major um, internal initiatives has been a cross-training program to give us flexibility for using resources, and so we, we've been taking advantage of that as well. So what we've seen um, in, with, traditionally with, with customer outsourcing is that the, the preferences can be very different depending on who you're talking to. Um, some people, we, 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 with some companies, they, they, they outsource at discovery, some preclinical, some clinical phase one, actually some even hold off outsourcing to later phases. Um, and often what we found is that the scientific preference is to develop methods in the house prior to transfer to us, even though we have expertise in the house who could do exactly the same task. Um, but they, that, they're, they're, the reason for that kind of approach is they, they want to address scientific issues up front. Um, and another thing that we often have to deal with is that if we are starting to work with a new customer, we want to have a regulatory audit um, ahead of any work starting. So our focus as a, as a CRO has been to remove any bottlenecks um, in terms of keeping projects moving forward. So we have resources in place to help outsourcing earlier in the process, and um, particularly in terms of method development. We have a strong method development team who have a wide experience in terms of, of project, of, in terms of compound um, structures, you know, what the molecules, a wide variety of, of, of um, just challenges in terms of molecules, et cetera. Um, we've also looked at making QA a remote process as much as possible. So we now have a lab tour available, lab tour video available to look at up front. Um, we can provide questionnaires up front. Um, we can also, as necessary, um, bring people from operations to do online presentations uh, with, with additional Skype or other meetings to answer questions. <clears throat> and so a big, 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 a strategy for us in terms of um, ensuring no interruption to our to our operations has been a cross training initiative that we've actually had in place for a uh, for a considerable amount of time, and this actually helps us plan ahead for rapid changes in workloads. Um, it's a development and training and development program that we apply to the entire scientific staff, um, and for us, it's a financial investment 
to create a coaching and mentoring culture. What it consists of is extended sabbaticals from a scientist within one team moving to a completely different part of the operation and learning how to, for example, going from the, our LCMS team to our ligand binding team and learning how to prepare and, and analyze runs within that, that system. It's, it's learning new technologies, learning different extractions, but basically growing the scientists' um, knowledge base. And so what this gives us is an increasingly skilled staff, which benefits the business in the long term. This is also aided by, we have a collaborative uh, forecasting process between our management, business development team and our operations team. So it gives us visibility to when projects are likely to happen and, and then helps us execute, and it and also helps us see any changes in timelines. They, another part of this, because we've got this collaborative process, is that there's constant internal communication about the projects and, and their, the likelihood of, of occurrence. Um, so it allows us to reallocate resources as things change rapidly. So if, if we have a bolus of work, we can move move people to hit that, to, 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 be, to be available to help the execution of that project. And this takes us to case study number one. This is a project where we saw a rapid expansion of workload. And it really comes down to what happens when one small project becomes many. So initial project scope was a small rodent study comparing two compounds. Um, however, in development, what we saw was uh, a number of scientific challenges based on chromatographic issues system and system carryover. And in discussion with the customer, we, we found out that other providers had struggled with this assay and actually the, the client themselves had, had struggled as well. We, we actually, through, work, through further work within our development team, we fixed the issue within the, the, the assay, which, sudden, which meant that actually the scope of the project rapidly expanded to include multiple studies running in parallel. There was multiple matrices, including plasma and tumor in multiple species, giving us almost 30 studies in total. Initially, the same small team handled the workload but as we saw this, this spike up quickly, we assigned personnel from other scientific teams as it rapidly expanded. What, what allowed us to do this was the upfront cross-training program. So people were already qualified in the technologies that they were applying to help them then support the team uh, to move, move the project forward. <clears throat> so uh, actually, as part of that, we also had multiple models of, of, each, of our, each of our instruments. We always have that for redundancy, but it helps, helps us do parallel analyses again. So you're, you're you're working to meet the timelines committed to. So we actually met the timelines for all the studies in this case. <clears throat> and so, as I said earlier, this isn't just about business as usual. Um, as, as, a, as a bioanalytical CRO, we're always looking for additional services that we can provide that, that complement what we already have on our docket and actually allow us to provide a, a fuller service to you as the customer. <clears throat> and one of our new services is, is Powder to Report. It's basically a strategy to expand beyond bioanalysis to full discovery provision. And what we're doing here is combining KCS's bioanalytical expert expertise with that of um, local in life facilities. There are a number of in life facilities in the Kansas City area. Um, this provides a path for animal studies to, to move forward, even while a sponsor has limited access to facilities like we are in the current situation. And our approach here is we ask, you provide us the powder, we, we, are, we can then provide the study design, the dosing strategy, the in-life schedule, bioanalysis and data reporting as needed. So it's, it's all taken out of your hands, but it still means that your, your projects are moving forward. <coughs> Excuse me. So as we, as we initiated this, what we wanted to do was to have a, a practical assessment of the in-life providers that we, we wanted to work with. So there was upfront discussion to, de to talk about how this could work and develop to develop the logistics of the relationship. Um, one of the key things was that we were looking for local providers. That way we're not reliant on, on sh uh, shipment by plane. We can get, we can get samples delivered to us by, by courier 
Um, so, so, so in the case of an unstable compound, these samples can be taken from the animal and we could have them within half an hour at our own facility. We're also looking at compatibility of operations. You know, how, how, do, how do we schedule the work? How can we ensure that there's a smooth handoff between the study phases? Um, a part of the, the, the scheduling thing was what was the ability of the in-life facilities to turn around projects quickly if that was something we needed. And another, another critical part was what's the skill set of the lab staff? So I'm going to pass this back to, to Amber as a the first for another poll. Great, thank you, John. And I'd like to ask our audience to participate in another brief polling question. Please click directly on the screen to enter your answers. Here's the question. How has the current environment affected your bioanalytical outsourcing? No change? Reduced due to changes in priorities? Increased in sticking with essential, I'm sorry, existing providers, or increased in looking to work with new providers. Again, how has the current environment affected your bioanalytical outsourcing? No change. Reduced due to changes in priorities. Increased in sticking with existing providers. Or increased in looking to work with new providers. Thanks for participating in our poll. Now let's take a look at what you guys have answered. Wow, it seems that the vast majority um, are experiencing no change, which is pretty interesting to me. Uh, John or Dominic, did you want to chime in with any observations? I can go first out. This is a little surprising. We are certainly seeing a um, much higher um, increase in those looking for new providers. So it is a little surprising to see that fourth bucket. Um, not, not, not anybody in our audience currently doing uh, or changing providers, but we have um, known due to the COVID shutdown of things, we've seen quite a bit of spike, as well as even as um, those are returning to the laboratory, we're feeling sort of a second wave as they're getting back into the lab, they're looking for new providers because they are so far behind they're going to need to try to make up that time and so again we're seeing quite a bit of activity uh towards new so this this was surprising to me i don't know about john yeah i think it's, it's certainly interesting I, I i think it's not the not the the sort of balance that i would tend to expect but uh, that's yeah let's move on Great. So, Dominic, um, well, I guess you'll be picking up the rest of the presentation. No, it's 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 still it's still with me. Oh, sure. So, John, okay. take us away. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So, um, just to, to go back to the expanding the discovery beyond bioanalysis, the uh, the practical assessment in life providers actually um, followed an, a known article. Um, basically, we selected diclofenac as a test article administered to sprig dolly rats. Um, dosing through IV and PO routes. Um, the, the reason for using diclofenac was it, 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 it's a, a known compound with fairly with very established properties and, and many published animal PK studies for comparison. It's a fast clearing drug with a first time point at two minutes post dose. So it's, there's your first assessment of the ability to deal with, 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 with getting set up and taking samples rapidly. And another part of it is um, the, to assess the tail IV dosing. If we missed the vein, then we would give a we would see um, apparent low plasma concentrations. Um, so we 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 like I say we've assessed a number of, of providers, and and we've had, got two who have, have passed this successfully. And once we've successfully completed pilot, the pilot studies, then we've moved forward with memoranda of agreements, and we're we're set to go with with these providers. So um, another thing that we, we do, uh, we focus on a lot in-house is um, collaboration across technologies. We are obviously a, a bioanalytical company and we have an extensive team focused on both um, ligand binding technologies and LCMS. Um, our, our take on this is 
the we we have we're agnostic to which whatever um technology we use we actually want to provide the best technology to provide the best solution so what we've seen um for for, for a long time is that ligand binding technologies have been the accepted primary approach and that would tend to be our approach too however um lcms can be a very useful resource particularly if lba shows a lack of specificity or, or interferences so here in LCMS, our approach is, is using um, a surrogate peptide to act, or a peptide to act as a surrogate of the, the intact molecule that we, um, you know, we can then quantitate the protein based on that peptide. And w with the, the, the it, it is a frequent use of immuno affinity extraction. Um, we're, we're basically we're applying the principles of LBA uh, as cleanup ready for, for the LCMS. And I'll pass on to Dom, who can talk through a couple of case studies about where, where we where we see LBA and LCMS working in harmony together. Thank you, John. Um, maybe before I jump into those case studies, a couple of things I wanted to sort of highlight that John went over that I think are some of the uh, things that we've been continuing to do um, despite the COVID outbreak. Uh, one of them is um, John touched on our cross training. That started um, in January of 2018, actually. And this is a, uh, in 2020, despite the pandemic, we have trained uh, nine of our scientists or analysts. And why this is important is because we have a career development path for all of our scientists. And they, uh, in order to go from scientists one to two or analysts one to two, they have to cross train in another department. So if you're a pharma regulated LCMS expert, you will have to go and cross train either in our biomarker um, department or you'll have to cross train in the ligand binding assay team. So this has been an initiative that has not slowed down. Uh, this is something we have been doing, as I mentioned, close to uh, two years now. We have 90, a total of about 90 uh, full-time employees that are at the bench and about 90% of them are cross trained in two different departments. And this really allows for us to, when we see that bolus of work coming, allow us to move and meet our client needs. So that, and because of that, that actually, what allows us to see that bolus of work is our forecasting. And in January of 2020, we actually implemented um, version, I'll call it three of our forecasting system. We now have three dedicated FTEs that do forecasting. And this allows for our operations side of things, as well as our um, business development team to uh, harness all of the information we're gathering and ensure that our lead times stay between three to four weeks, oftentimes one to two weeks, all during this outbreak. So these are the types of things that they're not really related to COVID per se, but this is all the way we're trying to continue with our growth. We have not seen any sort of slippage in our um, uh, growth as an organization, as well as we still even are recruiting and hiring. Last week, we hired upwards of five individuals. Um, that has been somewhat of a challenge in terms of having to do it remotely. But again, we have an HR team that is dedicated to three. Um, okay, great. I will move on to the case studies now. So the first case study, um, this is really a fascinating story where power of hybrid LCMS can be used. It was for development and validation of an ADC. And those of you that don't know what ADCs are, those are antibody drug conjugates, and those are when you take a large molecule that targets in some sort of, typically it's an amino oncology drug, it targets some sort of receptor in the body, and then you place a um, some sort of small molecule, often called a payload, onto it. So in this particular uh, case study, the client would, was looking for a total antibody as well as what is called the total antibody drug conjugate. So the total antibody is just what is sometimes referred to as the backbone. That would just be the large molecule of the antibody. And then the total ADC is the combination of the two. And this, is, this can be a very tricky thing to do. So the client did not invest in any sort of development of an antibody to the linker payload. So therefore, um, we or they campaigned to develop an anti-id. They did not do that. So we had limited shots on goal for the ADC by LCMS due to some site-specific some site conjugation. 
And what that means is this particular ADC had just two payloads on it, and um, they had uh, some unique uh, conjugation that allowed them to get on there. So the, we, the LBA option was not very good due to the limited amount of reagents that we had. So KCS proposed a couple different options. One was a combination of affinity capture and enzyme digestion followed by LCMS. And that, that in conjunction with using in silico models, helped to define potential surrogate peptide. So after screening different IPs, including polyclonal antibodies, monoclonal antibodies, and some commercially available payloads to affinity enrich. And again, in conjunction experimentally, the in silico, in silico peptides were confirmed. What I mean by that is you grab the drug, the large molecule, or the ADC in this case, with some sort of antibody, or um, so, again, in, some, in this instance, it was actually against the payload. And what that'll do is it brings it down, and then you digest it. And then, as John mentioned, you have some specific in silico peptides that are part of it. And so then that can be used to map it by the LCMS. So the outcome, we were able to successfully develop both assays, identifying specific unique peptides. One of the nice, um, one of the uh, really benefits of the affinity capture was we were able to detect peptides with the linker payload conjugate. And that is pretty unique in that that's certainly not something you can do by, or typically you cannot do by LBA or by mass spec alone. So, we really were able to, um, I'll think of it as even, not just fulfill the uh, client's needs, we were able to exceed them. And we also used the receptor approach because of the lack of monoclonal antibodies or polyclonal antibodies that were approached, meaning you use the IP against the antibody target to pull the protein out of solution. So some of the lessons learned, we were able to, again, do site-specific ADC analysis by LCMS. Um, using limited or no reagents, so hats off to the team to being able to unlock that. Um, the use of the peptide linker payload can be successful, which I think is something that is uh, often tried but not able to be done. And again, thanks to the uniqueness of our team, we were able to overcome that challenge. And then I think one of the depths of our organization is that we have such a breadth of knowledge around the approaches that we were able to use. You know, we used in silico approaches, before we even did an experiment, we were having um, trying to narrow down the, um, you know, the like the outcome and starting to focus before we were able to even do anything. And then enzymatic options, we tried many different enzymes to come up with the unique uh, surrogate, excuse me, the unique um, you know peptide map that was needed. And then we were able to identify surrogate peptides. All of that is uh, what allowed us to, uh, some of the lessons we learned when looking at ADCs. Also, um, NABs many times are considered the solution, but you have to have backups, assuming, you know, not assuming that a monoclonal antibody isn't going to be good, but, or even developed in this case. But again, I think that's what helps separate KCS is our ability to um, look at multiple approaches towards solving the problem. And things that we uh, sort of, again, continuing with our lessons learned, considerations for ADC technologies are reagent availability, cross-reactivity, and translatability. And what, I, what, what that means is that it would be able to um, go from species to species, so there's some sequential differences between species that you might be able to overcome, meaning if you had done it in some sort of non-clinical species and then go to human, despite maybe uh, that, 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 won't ha that should translate into um, having um, some benefits. Um, so the next case study, we looked at pivoting technologies. And again, this is one of the benefits of KCS is that all of our labs are in the same facility. So here we'll, we'll go over a couple instances where we started with LBA and then switched to LCMS. And the first challenge was our client needed a leukotriene, which is a small biomarker, but leukotrienes are frequently and often detected by 
ELISA kits or LBA platforms. We actually started with that platform and we tried, I believe it was three different ELISA kits. We even tried some uh, our SMCX Pro, which is a single molecule accounting instrument. And that, that didn't quite give us the sensitivity we needed. There were some challenges with uh, just the innate nature of leukotrienes. And so as a solution, we pivoted to the LCMS. And that, you know, we had some experience there and we investigated using LCMS. And sure enough, after a, a feasibility study, we were able to successfully develop an LCMS uh, method that had the sensitivity, um, and more importantly, it, it was actually uh, not only <clears throat> the sensitivity, the sensitivity in the matrix, which in this case was sputum, as well as the resolution of the various isomers. So not only were we able to look at LTB4, that was the target we were able to look at other leukotrienes as fallout from switching to LCMS. So the outcome was we were able to rapidly move from one platform to the other and achieve the sensitivity that our client needed and mo most importantly in the required time frame again this all happened in a very quick um, uh, process due to having all of the individuals in both the lba and the lcms side literally in the same offices or laboratories next to each other so on the flip side if we um we have an instance where we started with lcms and we thought that was, or at least our client thought that was <clears throat> the best or optimal platform to use. In this case, it was a pegylated protein, and it was um, attached to an, um, an endogenous cytokine. And so uh, due to this, the client had come to us and wanted to try LCMS, and we had money matrices that we were supposed to look at. And so we actually were able to develop a method for them, but the peg proved to be pretty challenging due to the number of pegs and the size of the peg. It actually caused some issues on the LCMS. But we did actually develop some methods, but they just weren't robust enough and reproducible enough. So again, because we have an LBA group right next to it, we were able to, and, and that group has experience in measuring peg. So we went ahead and used our experience with peg measurements and, and flipped that into an LBA method and allowed us to use commercially available reagents to develop a PK method that had the sensitivity and ruggedness for which was needed. So, you know, the outcome was we were able to move quickly from one platform to the other and overcome some of the challenges of one platform versus the other. So we kind of think of it as we have this big, nice tool chest at KCS and many labs only have maybe a screwdriver or a hammer, but we have saws and various types of screwdrivers and really we can solve just about any problem when it comes to any size of a given drug. So the lessons learned, as I mentioned, we have several technologies under one roof. We do routinely collaborate. It's, it's so uh, wonderful to see the collaboration take place within those groups. You can, we meet on a regular basis and it's just a wonderful um, experience to see them on, you know, whiteboards and getting down to <laughs> the nitty gritty on uh, solving problems for clients and creatively doing it. And again, the proximity is a, is a nice advantage and having all of that under the same facility really helps with our movement, our nimbleness, and our flexibility. So in summary, KCS has maintained a fully operational business despite the global slowdown. Our international, uh, excuse me, our internal cross-training program has ensured resources are available for all of our groups. And I think I touched on that around how we manage that. And it's something that we work diligently on. Um, we continue to look for additional ways to service our client base. Most recently we rolled out, as John described, our joint venture with an in-life facility. We have many other tricks up our sleeve that'll be coming out this year. Um, most notably is our, uh, we just uh, got our 21 color flow cytometer, which is fantastic news for someone like myself who's been working on flow cytometers for over 25 years when they were four color and took up the size of the room and needed special air conditioning and special lighting. And now you can get a 21 color platform that will fit on your desk. Amazing stuff. And then our LCMS and LBA teams collaborate on an ongoing basis to ensure we provide the best solutions to analytical challenges. 
And I hope we've been able to demonstrate some of that in our case studies. So I guess at this time, we'll take a moment and I'll send it back to Amber for some questions. Thanks, Dominic. And thank you both for such an informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found on the right-hand side of the presentation window. Here's our first question. What are the current lead times for new business? Hey, John, I can grab that one. Sure, so, go ahead. Due to uh, some of the uh, things that I touched on, both our forecasting as well as our, I, I didn't mention how much we invest in our production schedule, and that's something that John and I play a, a key role in. We help translate our business development intelligence is what we call that, and we help funnel that into our operations team. And right now, our lead times for non-regulated work are one to two weeks, and, and that's both across our ligand binding assay team, our biopharma team, as well as our biopharma LCMS team. So again, we could start almost immediately. On the regulated side for small molecule or pharma work, that lead time is again, maybe one to two weeks. On the LBA side, it's about three to four weeks. But our lead times over, and I've been with KCS for close to seven years, our lead times over the last, you know, we've been forecasting for almost three years, have been either at the most four to five weeks, and we work very hard to ensure that we can continue with our growth. Great, thank you, Dominic. Um, on to our next question. Where do you see the most opportunities over the next few months? Shall I start on that one? You bet. Yes, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, like like what we've seen, like I mentioned earlier, we, we've seen a slowdown in some some clinical studies, but um, also what we have noticed um, with with COVID being around is that a number of our customers are talking about um, possible application of their their drugs in the in the COVID sphere. So we actually are seeing an uptick in terms of potential uptick in terms of studies going in that direction. Um, Preclinical uh, seems to be filling the, the clinical hole to some extent as well. Um, so we're seeing a fair amount of opportunity there. And I think then also our biomarker panels um, are, are we're, we're, again, there's, there's a fair amount of discussion on that. I think you've got more detail on that, Dom. Yeah, John, absolutely. Our, uh, one of the, as John mentioned, biomarker panels for support of COVID. I know we're not supposed to be talking about that, but that, that is where we've seen a major uptick. Um, as well as, and, and that's mostly in our, um, we have the, you know, the entire Mesoscale Discovery 54 Plex qualified. And the major panel that people are looking at are um, pro-inflammatory cytokines. And we have a, a, a 10-plex that has been used um, just this, uh, just last week, we received um, about 40 samples from an, a, a study being done in uh, uh, Italy for compassionate use. It is um, uh, for late stage COVID patients, and uh, it's a small molecule that helps dampen the innate immune response and looks very promising for uh, those that have a cytokine storm to help reduce inflammation. And so that, that I don't have that data right now, but I'm sure we'll, we'll be interested to see it. We've also recently, um, there's a whole handful of other studies where people are, be, are using our pro-inflammatory panel. The other area that's growing is, I think I touched on it slightly earlier, is in the, um, over the last uh, month, we've had several large pharma as well as biopharma companies come to us and they're really having challenges with, A, they can't get into their facility and they know that when they can get back into the facility, they're not going to be able to run at 100% due to some the distancing that's going to have to take place. So they're really bracing themselves for, um, uh, outsourcing more, and we've been, uh, there are at least two or three instances where we're uh, looking to become what I'll call a preferred provider for um, research work or more on the develop, early development work. You know, things like uh, the, there's something called a universal assay where people can, uh, you, you can do a 
methodology in a non-human matrix, and you could measure any sort of MAB or ADC. And we've been doing this method for several years, and now there's a group engaging us there, as well as um, we're seeing a, a somewhat of an uptick um, in uh, biomarker analysis, as John said, and it's it, and those are uh, there's some I, I believe there's some movement towards clinical trials starting to uptick a little bit. So we've seen some uh, uptick in even you know recently some uptick in in clinical work, which is quite promising. I think people are starting to get ready to get back to normal in the clinical side of things. Great, thank you for mentioning that. So let's check out our next audience question. Um, what additional platforms would KCAS be interested in introducing? Yeah, so I can so, take that one uh, first, John. Oh, go ahead, John. Yeah, sure. Um, so from a LCMS perspective, um, we're, we're a triple quadruple based business, and it, 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 we're definitely interested in looking at what high resolution can can bring us, particularly in the realm of, of large molecule measurements, et cetera. Um, and also, uh, as we see more and more challenging medicines, um, particularly in terms of the bioanalysis, it seems that sensitivity is, is always the, the, the issue. Um, and we have a, a, a number of, of API 6500s, um, but we actually find that the, currently the bulk of the work has been directed to those instruments. Um, so we're always looking for more and more sensitivity. That's, those are the main, and actually, then the other part of it for um, from our spec is always what other sample cleanup um, pr procedures are out there that might help further or further automation of the sample cleanup that we're already doing. I'll add, uh, I Go talked ahead. about adding our flow cytometer, right? That was one. We're increasing our colors from 19 to 21. A couple other platforms we're considering. One is something called an LE spot. And this is a, um, a very um, informative platform. It actually is an advancement on ELISA's. It's, I wouldn't call it a new platform, but it's one that's emerging specifically in gene therapy, you know, uh, stem cell therapies and CAR T cell space. And so there are two ways to monitor one's ability to generate autologous T cell responses. So what I mean by that is uh, you can measure an individual by flow cytometry, or by LE spot to determine if they have T cells that are specific to either some sort of uh, amino oncology target or even towards whatever you are vaccinating them with or treating them with. And so you can get a baseline measurement and then as you do your experimentation, you can see increases. So what, that, what I'm saying is that you can see in somebody that might have in 50,000 cells, they might have five circulating IFN gamma producing cells against a given amino oncology peptide vaccinate them, and then subsequently they have, you know, 50 to 500 over time. And the only two platforms that are recognized by the FDA are um, flow cytometry and LE spot. That's one thing we certainly are anticipating to bring on um, here in 2020. Um, I think that I felt like there was one other, but it escapes my mind right now. I think we're uh, going to continue with uh, bringing on more uh, biomarker panels, that's something we've invested heavily in, um, but I think that uh, about covers our new uh, technology. Great, thanks for sharing that information. On to the next audience question. How do you determine your strategy for large molecule bio, excuse me, bioanalysis? <laughs> Well, I can start. Yeah. That. And I, I, I touched on it on on one of the slides that really, if we have reagents available, um, because of the speed that you could get going with ligand binding, um, that that would be our, our our technology of choice to get started with. However, you know, if we if we start observing issues, that is when we would probably bring in LCMS to see if if that can address anything that we find. Um, also, it, to some extent, it depends on the question that we're being asked to solve. Um, it may be one of those cases that we actually apply both technologies at once to, to drill into the question being asked to see which platform gives us the best gives, gives us the best result for the long term. And actually, this, this actually plays into something we were already talking about. We uh, do a, a weekly podcast, um, and we actually 
uh, we've been doing it since since the, the COVID uh, situation started um, to talk about bioanalysis and um, actually the approach to to large molecule bioanalysis is a feature of our upcoming podcast next week. So if you want to visit that, it, you can find that at kcsbio.com. Yeah, I'll just add, I think the nature of the large molecule can really play an impact. I think when you look at things that are endogenous, it might be advantageous to look at it by um, some sort of affinity capture LCMS because that maybe allows you to have a little bit more distinguish in terms of distinguishing between your drug versus something that's endogenous. That's what I mean there. That that is one case. And then taking the case study, and we talked about how a pegylated compound or something that might have something that could potentially perturb the LCMS instrumentation is when you're going to favor the LCMS side of things. But as John said, it really should be, um, you know, a discussion with us. We can uh, certainly bring in our experts who. Uh, can help um, make some critical decisions to help uh, help you know get get you started in what uh, platform might be best. And sometimes there is instances where it might make sense to just look at both of them in parallel. Excellent, thank you, Dominic. So I believe we have time for at least one more question. Uh, so someone from our audience wants to know if you can remind them of what you guys do in the anti drug antibody detection and what reagents you require to get started? I'll field this one. This is in the immunogenicity space. So um, typically what is required for anti-drug antibody detection is some sort of at least polyclonal serum, um, where that, what I mean by that is you would vaccinate an animal and uh, get some antibodies generated against the drug of interest. That is actually the preferred, what is called PC, or positive control for ADA methods. Um, that, that is typically the minimum that's needed. Um, there's also um, uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies, and that's a little bit more of an investment where you would have to go and, um, you know, uh, do a whole hybridoma system and make an, what is called an anti-id antibody, typically, or some form of... I guess I'm being very specific to monoclonal antibodies or drugs that are antibodies when I say anti-id antibodies. Uh, maybe that's a lot of an acronyms that nobody <laughs> fully understands what I'm talking about. But to, to directly answer the question, you need at least some polyclonal serum. And then we like to take the drug. So we need the drug and some sort of antibody against the drug. And sometimes you can get a commercially available antibody against the drug. You don't have to actually go and make something. Our preference, our recommendation would be to make polyclonal sera because that is what the FDA likes to see. Um, but then, so it's basically two, two things are required, antibody against the drug of interest, as well as um, the drug itself. And then we generate a couple reagents for you because we prefer to do it by electrochemoluminescence or the mesoscale discovery um, platform, and that has many advantages, but um, we would then biotinylate and lithium labeled. I'm going to stop there because I think there's one more question we'd like to get to. Sure, and this actually looks like a, a pretty fun question to answer. So mm -hmm. um, our last question will be, are new small molecule drugs still relevant? I'm going to answer this one. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think this is a, is a pet, pet peeve of mine where people have said that small molecule drugs don't have a future. Um, if you look at, uh, and we actually again discussed this on a, on a recent podcast, if you looked at drug approvals, uh, I think it was in, it would be in April, um, the vast majority of the drugs that were approved in April were actually small molecule. So it, it, there definitely is some need for them. Also with COVID, and we're back to the topic we were trying to avoid today, um, what we're seeing is a multitude of symptoms. Um, so although the the need for vaccine is, is obviously the highest profile question that we're looking for an answer to, um, there's so many different uh, therapeutic effects, or sorry, not so many effects that COVID is having on the body that the, there's, there's plenty of need for alternative therapies to address those um, address those conditions. I mean, we've we've heard about the cytokine storms 
Um, so it's the other anti-inflammatories that can close those down. Um, obviously, remdesivir, the, the one drug that has been given the nod to treat COVID, is a small molecule. Um, ab absolutely, I see small molecules as, as having a, a place in the future, and I'm sure it'll at least get me past retirement. Yeah, the, the, John, we've talked about that on our podcast. Uh, it's certainly uh, surprising. I don't think surprising is the word, but, you know, the 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 um, the myth that small molecules are no longer relevant just simply isn't true. And, you know, that's coming from somebody who's heavily on the, uh, you know, large molecule side of things. And so it's always, I, I agree with everything John said, and I think it's a misnomer that uh, small molecules are um you know, a way of the past. Great. Thank you both so much. Uh, but unfortunately, we're out of time today. I would like to thank the audience for attending and for participating in today's event. I would also like to thank our sponsor, KCAS, for making today's educational webcast possible. You will receive an email alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Thanks again to all for joining, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.